Okay, in lecture 5b, this time around, we're going to talk about retouching. Now, retouching, just to define the term in, in uh, regard to how we're discussing it here in this class, has to do with using Photoshop tools to modify the pixels of an image, destructively or non-destructively, ideally, in order to remove elements that are distracting or undesirable. So that can be applied to all sorts of different things, products, people's faces, um, landscapes, architecture, whatever it is, any kind of modifications that we make to an image, we're not creating a composite, a new image using multiple sources, like uh, we covered in the last lecture. This time we're talking about just modifying existing images. Now, a lot of times that uses some of the same techniques. There's a lot of overlap between compositing and retouching in terms of the tools and techniques that you use. So we're not focused so much on that. Retouching in terms of what we're doing in this class has to do more so with the goals of the, the tools and techniques that you're using. What are you trying to accomplish with that? So some of the things that we're going to talk about are liquefy, cloning and healing tools, and the content aware stuff. Now, um, just like last time, I want to show you some examples of poor retouching. Um, you'd be surprised when you look for this kind of stuff. It's out there everywhere. Um, there are a lot of uh, either really bad retouchers or more likely people that are under tight deadlines and working really fast and uh, slipping up because they're working too hard or uh, not getting enough sleep or whatever the reason is. Or like I said at first, they're just bad. There's a lot of both. Uh, all these in, in lots of examples here. Um, I did the academically unthinkable and I copy pasted a bunch of images from BuzzFeed and Mashable. <laughs> so you may recognize some of these if you are a constant uh, surfer of those sites. But anyway, it, like I said, it's easy to find tons of these kind of examples. In a quick Google search, I'm sure you can find lots on your own. This particular image is from an uh, online retailer. I don't know who it was. I can't remember now. But anyways, uh, you can see initially right off the bat what's wrong. The zoomed in image shows up close that she was holding a purse or handbag and that was photoshopped out, obviously intentionally. Uh, however, it, it wasn't completed. So it looks like somebody got the idea that we need to retouch this, take it out, uh, but they just didn't finish the job. A lot of times that's the case. Some detail got missed or just didn't get finished. Take a look at this one here. So you see that there is secretly a hand that's shown up on her shoulder um, that happens so often <laughs> on the right hand side, they've cloned the baby from one side to the other because somebody else was holding the baby in the picture. This was a whole clone job. Brad was cloned from one side to be closer in just to make a better layout for this spread, but they forgot to hide his left leg. He has two left legs. You see over on the left hand side of the image bottom, there's uh, another leg. It's obviously his leg cloned over. And then you've got the baby's head showing up twice. Missed details, definitely. Right here, it looks like somebody started this project and didn't quite finish it. So you've got the soccer player leaned over there and obviously a quick cut paste job that didn't get finished. On the right hand side, another hand floating awkwardly or creepily, however you want to describe that, on her shoulder. Uh, there was a third person in this photo that didn't make it into the final cut. These three images right here show again, uh, just simple lack of attention to detail. Quickly rushing through a job is gonna wind up with this sort of thing every time. So aside from the retouched body proportions, which is a whole nother topic we're not getting into this time around, um, she's missing a good section of her leg in the image on the left. Um, something was cloned in or, or copied and composited from another photo possibly, but her leg didn't make the cut. In the image of Time Magazine, you can see the, the shadow has some problems there. Doesn't quite match up. That was, again, a quick job dropping in the shadow and just not transforming it to fit. On the right-hand side, you see in the inset zoomed-in portion of the image, there's some weird stuff going on there at the bottom of that image. Again, making a composite, quickly retouching things and not paying attention to details. The Lexar packaging um, makes you wonder, am I really getting an eight gig or a four gig? The image on the right, uh, something's missing there on the left side of her body. Last time around, we talked about dropping in faces into a group photo to quickly add people in that weren't there before. There are some important considerations. One, you gotta make sure the lighting is the same, that helps. 
If not, you need to fix it so that it does match. Second, try to get the backgrounds removed. Don't just cut and paste ovals around their heads and drop them in there. Anyway, <laughs> don't do it like this. This is the idea as far as putting in faces into another photo, but you gotta be careful. All right, now talking about a couple of tools here real quick. So we have the Liquify tool and I've got a couple of animations showing some new features of this tool. As of CC 2015, there are face aware tools. So Photoshop Liquify is going to recognize faces in your photos. I don't have all this, the screenshots of this tool. You can go through it yourself on an image with a face in it. Just click on filter liquify. And if you remember back to last lecture, make sure you convert it to a smart object first so that you can go back and change these settings. But anyway, it's gonna recognize where the eyes are and where the mouth is and where the nose is and all these different facial features. And so you can use very refined parametric uh, editing tools on, um, on facial features. And if you're unfamiliar with that term, parametric just means parameters, you're editing parameters. So instead of pushing random pixels around based on your desired taste, then you have parameters for the eyes, size, height, width, tilt, distance, and all those different things. Uh, same for the mouth, the nose, and all eyebrows and whatever else you want to whatever else you want to do. So that's a little bit more advanced, newer feature in Liquify is face aware, and it's just a part of it. Obviously, you don't use Liquify on every single face, and not every single image even has a face in it. The image on the bottom of the clock just shows a really basic, simple idea of what Liquify does. It is its tool-based warp. So you use your cursor and your mouse to push pixels around and smudge them and distort them, and you can bloat and warp and twist and all kinds of stuff, pinch. Anyway, Play around with that. It's a fun tool to make funny faces out of your friends or uh, modify things, but be careful. Remember, less is more usually. So when you're using Liquify, if you are drastic about that, you're gonna severely change the shape and size of the pixels of the image, and image data is only gonna push so far before it starts to become noticeable. Now there are various cloning and healing tools as well that are used extensively for retouching. And again, this goes for faces, uh, retouching blemishes out of a portrait or something like that, as well as changing things in an image of an architectural photograph or a sky or a landscape or whatever it is. So um, running through these, the clone stamp tool is probably the oldest, definitely the oldest of these tools. And it's the most straightforward. You sample an area that you wanna be your source area using the Alt or Option key. Click on that, it's going to target that area, and then as you hover your cursor over where you want to paint in, you'll see with newer versions of Photoshop, it's going to give you a preview of the pixels being copied from your source area onto your target area. And as you brush that in there, it's going to um, paint those pixels in at a one-to-one -one reproduction of your source area uh, based on your brush size and opacity and feathering and all that kind of stuff. The next, the spot healing brush tool is going to works similarly to clone stamp in that it's going to copy pixels from around your selection into where you're painting, except it's going to do it in an automated way. So this tool um, works really well for certain things and not so well for other things. You can play around with this, but your brush size is going to affect the results quite a bit. I tend to try and use the smallest brush size I can get away with depending on the content. You want to also completely brush over the area that you want to replace. Uh, rather than just getting it partially. If you partially brush over it, it's going to give you bad results. Um, spot healing brush tool I found works really well for things like power lines, stray hairs, um, details like that that don't fit in, but they're, they have good contrast uh, and they don't fit a pattern. So they go against the grain, for example, hair going across a bunch of other strands of hair. Spot healing brush works really well at replicating the pattern of hair going in one direction and removing the single stray hair going across the grain. Okay, next up, Healing Brush Tool works very similar to Spot Healing Brush, but it's a mixture of a clone stamp tool too. You select a target area using all their option, and then it's gonna paint in based on the textures and colors of that source area, rather than just looking at the, the pixels around right where you're painting like the Spot Healing Brush Tool does. Patch Tool is one of my favorites too for retouching. Use it for all kinds of things, it's going to let you take a selection. You can click on the patch tool and use that as a lasso and make a selection. I prefer to use other selection techniques. You can use anything you want. 
the marquee tool, um, any of the marquee tools, any of the lasso tools, any of the other selection techniques you have. It doesn't, it's not intended to use with super complex selections. So if, if I have made something like with color range that selects uh, all the colors within an image, it's not really built for that. But it's going to let me take, say, a selection of a window in one place of the building that I don't want. For example, I want to remove a window from a building. I can select that window and drag it onto a portion of the wall that doesn't have a window in it. And depending on whether I'm choosing source or target in the options panel, I'm going to either copy the window or fill in that selected area with the wall, the blank wall area that I dragged it to. So there's a couple different ways you can use that. Experiment, try it out, definitely. Okay, content aware fill. This is kind of similar to the patch tool, but it's more automated. So in this case, you simply select something that you want to fill in an area in this picture. In this case, the guy on the left is being selected. You could use this content aware fill to fill in the plant, the vine growing on the wall, or you could select an individual brick from within the wall and use it on that. Whatever it is, it fills in all kinds of stuff and it works remarkably well. So the trick is making sure that you include enough of the detail around the object to include in the fill. If I were to make a super tight refined selection right around this guy, I'm actually usually going to get poorer results than if I make a loose selection like what you see in the image. Once you do make your selection, again, you can use any selection technique you want. I like to use areas of high contrast, use something like the quick select tool and make a good selection and then modify that selection to expand it and add plenty of room around the edges. And that's usually a quick way to go about doing that. Then choose edit, fill, or use the keyboard shortcut shift F5 and uh, make sure that you choose content aware for the contents of your fill. That fill dialog or fill command shift F5 or edit fill is going to bring you the option to choose all kinds of different fills. We don't want to fill with a pattern or solid color or anything like that. We want to do content aware. Make sure that color adaptation is turned on. Hit OK and you'll see that most of the time it's going to dramatically and automatically fill in the image based on surrounding content around the edges of your selection. Works pretty well. Another similar tool is the content or move tool. This one's located under the healing brush tools in that tool group. Content or move, it's gonna be the keyboard trick at J or if you don't know how to toggle through nested tools, hold down shift on your keyboard and hit that J over and over. It's gonna cycle through all of those. Same with all the other nested tools. Um, with this technique, you're going to use whatever selection method you want to select the object that you want to move. Or you can just click on content aware tool, a move tool and use it like a lasso, just like the patch tool, grab the object and drag it somewhere else. Once you've made a selection and it's going to duplicate that object into the new place and it's going to backfill where it came from with the area around it. So it's kind of like a combination of content aware fill and moving the object content or fill and the patch tool, I guess is a better way to put it. So it's combining those. You could do the same thing in several different ways, I guess, but this is a faster way to accomplish some of those steps. There are two different modes to be aware of. So there's move, which lets you just place the object at a different location. And you can also switch the mode to extend, which is rather than moving it, it's going to let you transform the object, which expands or make it larger or smaller. And, and it applies that content where um, filling in the area around it. Uh, the structure is a setting that allows you to specify exactly how much the pattern should play into that. So that value, again, will give you different results. You, you're going to want to experiment with that and see what gives you the best results. Color has to do with color blending. If I'm going to grab an airplane and move it to a different part of the sky, I need to be aware of whether there is a difference in the blue of the sky. Close to the horizon, it's going to be one shade of blue. Up high in the sky, it's going to be a different shade of blue. And so adjusting that from 0 to 10 is going to give me different amount of color blending. 10 is going to give me the most color blending. Uh, so that can be a good thing. It can be a negative thing too. It varies depending on the subject matter. Sample all layers um, is going to just simply look at all the other layers in, that are visible in the image to determine how to create that result. And transform and drop simply gives you the option to kind of um, include that extend command in your content or move. 
because it gives you those transform handles as you move it over to drop it you can resize it along with that step so pretty helpful sometimes you, to just toggle transform on drop by default it should be checked um, and and you can always just apply the, the the move without any kind of transformation if you don't want to just because it's there doesn't mean you have to do it so these are some really basic tools for retouching uh, retouching is a huge category that includes a whole lot of stuff um, everything from removing power lines from a photo to moving architectural uh, features of a building, adjusting lighting within a scene, um, removing blemishes or stray hairs, things like that, all the way to complete facial and body reconstruction that you see in a lot of the fashion photos and uh, advertising photos that are out there, marketing type stuff. Product enhancements and retouching. Food photography undergoes tremendous amounts of retouching. Just look at a picture of a McDonald's hamburger on the menu and then go order the exact same burger and take a look at the two. And you'll get a real quick idea, if you don't have it already, just how much retouching has gone into some of those product photos and advertising and food photos. So um, retouching is a huge industry, actually. There are people who make a living, obviously, as full-time retouchers. So if that's something that you're interested in, Move on to GIT 334 next semester and take that class where we'll spend a lot more time on retouching there.